Marty, thank you so much. That was really wonderful. Dean Wilson, Professor Clark. I'm, I'm so honored to be here, um, not only to get this award, but USC does hold a special place in my heart because of Warren Bennis and my long relationship with him. Um, and so I knew this is a very special place and I've been enjoying greatly getting to know more about what the Lear Center does and I'm very impressed. So um, I hope to be in that tradition in talking about how, we've cr how we create a better world, how we make change. And you know, change, I'm gonna talk about a culture for innovation, but it all, that's really all about change. It's about new ideas, putting them into use. It's about entrepreneurship. Change is a difficult topic. I mean, I struggle with change. I actually personally hate change um, because change is generally what somebody else is making me do. Um, but what I love is I love new ideas. I love things that I am initiating, and I think that's true of all of us. Change is a threat when it's done to us, but it's an opportunity when it's done by us. And we're living in a time where questions of change, how we change, um, are absolutely central to the kinds of lives we lead and everything we do. And since the time Everett Rogers did his work, we have come around to seeing change differently. I mean, he was part of a tradition, I think, that came out of World War II, in which social psychology burgeoned as a field because the government wanted social psychologists to help them understand how to get people to do what the government wanted them to do. That was really the origin. It was persuasion to get people to buy war bonds, for example. How do we do that? And that was the origin of many of these fields. And that has continued, that tradition continued for a while, where change was all about what we were making other people do, and communication was an instrument, a tool, to get people to change their behavior in ways that would suit authorities and establishments. And I remember when I was a baby professor, and by the way, that campaign that Marty and I worked on, I had just become eligible to vote, um, um, that I was approached when I was a baby professor, baby consultant, by a very large, very distinguished company that said, will you come and help create a training program on change? And I got very excited because my view of change, aside from not liking people doing it to me, was that it was all about empowering people to seek ways to develop their ideas. I had that view from the very beginning of my career. It was part of wanting to open opportunities to women. It was part of creating new kinds of social structures and social systems. It was about solving problems. It was about innovation and entrepreneurship that could make lives better. So I got very excited when this large company approached me with that idea. And I said, this is really wonderful that this big bureaucracy wants to give people an opportunity to learn to master change by doing it, by creating the change. And they said, no, no, that's not what we have in mind. What we have in mind is that you help us teach people how to be more receptive to the changes we want them to do. Every time we introduce a new program, a new policy, and we parted company at that point. And by the way, the large company increasingly had issues with the question of who is the originator of innovation and change. There was a period of time in around the same time as that ill-fated campaign, which would have changed our lives. Um, that ill-fated campaign, when that company was in trouble, and it was trying to be a solutions company. It was in technology. And it was trying to be a solutions company that would offer solutions to their customers. And again, I thought that was really terrific, a wonderful shift of mindset. But then a senior vice president in the company was widely quoted as saying that if customers don't like our solutions, 
they've got the wrong problem. So there's an honorable history of not thinking about innovation as something that emanates from the people. Innovation as something that creates new possibilities that have not been envisioned by people who are already in power. And that is the kind of, that is not the kind of culture that provides innovation. Innovation is part of what gives us the opportunity to express a part of ourselves that's equally as important as the anger and fear and preservation. One of the things that is among the many things that are totally annoying to me about one segment of the current presidential campaigns is that it's all about anger and fear and preservation and no change. In fact, get it back to the way it was. And then, then I hear people saying, but that's a human impulse. And I believe that an equally important human impulse is the impulse to create, is the impulse to improve. And in fact, when I was studying sports enters into this, and yes, I have advised um, some coaches and teams, because in one of my books I wrote about um, sports teams as well as businesses and communities and countries in looking at what creates downward spirals of continuing failure, what creates upward spirals with the momentum of success, and how do leaders turn it around? So losing streaks, winning streaks, and turnarounds from losing to winning. And one of the things I discovered is that losing streaks, you can predict who's gonna go downhill, by the way, because losing streaks involve predictable behavior. It's when Decisions become, get made in secret behind closed doors, in which the mode is anger and blame and finger pointing, in which pieces of the same organization or the same company start finger pointing and blaming each other. And as a, re, as a result, because anger and blame are totally unproductive emotions, they don't lead to action, they don't lead to change, they don't lead to innovation, because they're unproductive emotions in response. Collaboration goes down, ideas are stifled, and people go passive, believing there's nothing that they can do about it anyway. And in contrast, in a winning streak, in a winning streak, people believe in possibility. People share information, it's open and, trans and transparent, there are opportunities for people to contribute. There's a sense of collaboration and teamwork that comes from valuing one another and believing that if we're in this successful organization or country, then any of our ideas are good ideas and they're worth supporting, and that creates more innovation. So this helps us express the better parts of ourselves. Um, and it also creates dynamic societies, and America needs innovation. We have thrived on innovation. We've been a country not only of immigrants, but of innovators, of entrepreneurs who have created new possibilities. And now, it's hardly surprising today, as opposed to when I had to deal with the big bureaucracies years ago, it's, it's almost, a cliche to say we want more innovation. Everybody wants more innovation. Innovation is the thing that we say is going to save us. If new technology might take jobs, well, innovation will create more jobs, new ideas, new ways to use the tools and technology. So there's a great rising groundswell of believing that while the federal government won't do anything for us, entrepreneurs will. And that is now the national mood. So it hardly seems surprising for me to put innovation at the center, a culture for innov innovation. Well, you know, first of all, I agree that not every innovation is necessarily a great idea. Just because it's a new idea, it doesn't mean it's a great idea. Um, but this is a different world where this is our belief about where problems will be solved. This is what we are counting on to build the future. And what's ironic is those who are suffering due to societal change 
who therefore need innovation the most, find it the hardest to generate because of the stifling effects of anger and blame and infighting. And I have talked about these ideas, by the way, not only at the level of businesses and sports teams, but also in countries. I looked at the turnaround of South Africa under Nelson Mandela, and I've been in places like Jamaica, who had believed they were on a losing streak and wanted to know how to change behavior so that they could produce more of the ingredients of the momentum of success. So innovation turns out to be central, and everyone really wants it. Innovation and entrepreneurship are the rage. And in fact, outsiders seem to be in, and anything that looks like the establishment is suspect. In fact, I'm a little apologetic that I come from Harvard University and especially from Harvard Business School. Um, but actually, I think they're great institutions, so I'm not going to be, you know, play coy here and say they're not good. But you have to feel that if you've succeeded, there's something wrong with you um, because that makes you part of the establishment. Well, we know establishments are out and entrepreneurship is in. And we know that that's true because of the lengths to which people will go to express their ideas and become part of the entrepreneurial world of change. And I actually think that's totally positive. I don't mind encouraging establishments to step aside or to change. In fact, that same entrepreneurial spirit outside can happen inside established organizations. And that's what we need in the digital era which is disrupting and changing nearly everything. And entrepreneurs will go to great lengths today because it's so in. I am particularly struck by the number of entrepreneurial challenges and co-working living spaces and that it's a norm now that in many parts of the world, that you have to have a business plan. Now, I realize that we're here in Los Angeles where everybody's got a script in their back pocket. But in many of the places where I hang out, Silicon Valley, Austin, Texas, Boston, you have to have a business plan now in your back pocket or you can't play with the big folks. You're not allowed into the conversation. It's all about entrepreneurship. And I just read about a uh, an entrepreneurial pitch contest, which shows you how far entrepreneurs will go. It was in Finland, and 20 groups from around the world came to Finland to compete in the midnight pitch contest, in which they had to give their pitch while standing outside in ice cold water <laughs> at midnight. Well, you have to really believe in your idea to want to do that. And, but entrepreneurship is all the vogue, and many cities feel that their revival will be based on entrepreneurship, and so do established companies. And I will tell you in a minute a few of the ways we get a culture for innovation, get the entrepreneurial spirit inside established organizations, because they have to change too. But here's a kind of establishment, established organization. Um, this is a global advertising, marketing, and communications firm called the Publicis Group, um, based in France. It's now the third largest such group in the world. And they want to go through a transformation. The transformation, um, they're not just creative in themselves, but they want to do more than that. They realize their future because digital has changed everything, and their business is no longer making 30-second TV commercials, their business is using new media in ways that interact with people in a, different, in a different form. And so they understand that their business is not just creativity, that they come up with something cool for their clients, but they have to start inventing for their clients. And that's really a change of mindset that they have to be ahead of them. And rather than catching up by figuring out how to get on social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, they might be able to invent the platforms. And so they are, like many established companies now, figuring out how to harness the entrepreneurial spirit 
in their own company. And in fact, Publicis, which was started in Paris, wonderful if you have been to Paris and been on the Champs-Élysées, you've probably been to the drugstore, which is right next to Publicis headquarters because it was started after World War II <coughs> by the founder who was so happy that the Americans had won the war. He loved everything American, and he wanted an American-style drugstore in Paris. So he started Le Drugstore, which sold everything. Um, and now these innovation labs for publicists have a little echo of history, because we don't want to forget history even when we innovate. They're called the drugstore. And in the drugstores now, this company is trying to find ways, as a large established company, in media to innovate. So we all want innovation. We all know that entrepreneurship is the wave of the future. Sort of we know that. That is, the people who feel positive and who feel that their areas will benefit like innovation, it's those who feel left behind, who feel on a losing streak, that are likely to oppose it. And that's always worth remembering. The resistance often comes from people who feel it's imposed upon them rather than something they are able to do to create a better and brighter future. So, you know, everyone wants more innovation. I get asked all the time um, by organizations to come and tell them how to get more innovation, which is what I'm about to talk about. And sometimes the first question I get is, we want more innovation. Who else is doing it? All right, well, I kind of laugh at the irony of that because the whole idea of innovation is that you're doing something novel. It takes courage because you're doing something nobody's ever done before and you can't necessarily prove it yet. So that's in the nature of innovation. I, al I also hear from companies who say, we want to be innovators, we just don't want to be the first. <laughs> so same attitude, let's be a little safe rather than courageous, or I hear, we want new ideas. Nope, not that one, not that one, not that one, not that one. So there's a lot of lip service and not enough acceptance of the fact that there will be mistakes in the innovation process. So let me tell you about some of the ingredients that I think are very important to build a culture of innovation. Whether you're building that culture for yourself or in an organization, in a business, in an institution of higher education, in a community, in a nonprofit, or in a country. Here are some of the keys. The first thing is, you do have to be open to lots of ideas. First, innovation only starts because somebody has an idea. And you often can't tell where the idea is going to come from. So there are a couple of lessons about innovation um, that I've learned through the years and that much research, in addition to my own, backs up. The first thing is, if you want more successes in, at innovation, you need more failures, meaning you just need more ideas. It's the sheer volume of ideas that starts the process. And a culture of innovation allows thousands of ideas to surface, like a thousand flowers bloom. I find that also ironic because the man to whom let a thousand flowers bloom was attributed um, ran a very authoritarian regime. So I guess that's another one of, yeah, not that idea, not that idea, not that idea, but let a thousand flowers bloom. Well, you do have to let a thousand flowers bloom and they won't all live. And you have to be willing to go on to the next one, but let them surface. And it's also true that innovation comes from unexpected places, unexpected sources, often not where you're exactly looking and not where it's being ordered by the top. You know, in that era of stifling innovation when the U.S. desperately needed to have its companies changed, I used to say, tongue in cheek, about participative management, that participation was what the top ordered the middle to do for the bottom. Well, the top can't order people to give them their best ideas. All it can do is create a receptive environment. Otherwise, you have situations, which we have seen 
in which people work for a large organization, they find an opportunity, a flaw, a piece of technology, that large organization isn't going to do anything about it, so they spend their time in that company dreaming up their own business, writing their own business plan, and then they leave to start it, and that organization that had nurtured them never gets any of the benefit. That goes on all the time. Um, and it's not just that entrepreneurs would rather not be part of large organizations. In fact, large organizations, establishments, provide an awful lot of benefits to entrepreneurs. But the ideas have to surface. The ideas have to find a hearing. The ideas have to have somebody that wants to accept them. You need a multiplicity of ideas. You need them from everyone, not just the people who are in an R&D lab or are defined as our new venture unit, because sometimes they get blinders on too and don't see new possibilities. In fact, those new possibilities are all around you from anybody in the organization who experiences the product or has the need. I remember consulting to a large food company that wanted more innovation and um, talking to top management and listening to them talk about the problems with getting new ideas. And it then occurred to me partway through the conversation that they had a very large employee body for the products they were already making. And I said to them, well, wait a minute. Doesn't everybody in your company eat food? I said, why don't you ask them? Why don't you ask the people what they're, what they're feeling, what they're wanting, and what they're seeing as they travel, what trends? And it's always remarkable to me that people are asked to put aside what they know about life when they enter doors, the door of an organization, as opposed to being encouraged, regardless of their position or function, to be the developer of new ideas. And what's so important about that is not simply that you might get a really great idea out of that that you hadn't thought about, but you also have a culture that's more receptive to the idea of innovation. Because if I'm allowed, if you're allowed, if you're empowered to bring forth ideas, even if it isn't necessarily chosen, you're more receptive to the idea of new ideas. And that can make a huge difference in how quickly a community moves, how quickly an organization can make change. And so you build receptivity when you start big searches for ideas. And so I believe all of these business plan contests, although I wouldn't necessarily go to Finland and plunge in icy water at midnight, but I understand that the US ambassador to Finland did that in order to kick off this event. We are willing to go to great lengths these days. Um, but what you do is you create a receptive environment so that those ideas that are good ideas don't get submerged in the water, they move to the surface. And that is part of a culture of innovation. So we need to find the ideas in the first place, and they're everywhere. It's why crowdsourcing has become the mode. We can't figure it out, leaders say, but I'll bet if we just go to the internet, somebody somewhere has an idea and a solution, and you know what? They often do, um, because ideas come often from the periphery, as I said, from the unexpected. But the more you have feeding into the funnel, the more likely it is that good ideas will be heard and listened to. Someone somewhere has the idea. But you also need in an organization to, to find ideas. You need the time for tinkering. And you need the space to do that thinking and that reflection. And so I think it's become pretty familiar now that Google is one of the companies. There have been companies that are innovative throughout the entire time I've been studying this. Uh, sets aside, allows professionals 15 to 20 percent of their time to work on projects or ideas of their own choosing. Well, there are those at Google who say that's kind of a myth. 
but it doesn't matter. Having that myth there that it is part of your job to come up with things, to have fun coming up with things. And maybe if you feel you don't have any creative ideas, you just go down the hall, talk to a few other people, meet them at the food bar. You hear their idea and you think, ah, that's interesting, I'll build on that. And so it creates an environment in which more ideas surface. So having places and spaces um, and to also set really big goals because I said innovation takes courage. It isn't saying innovation, who else is doing it? I'm only gonna copy, I don't wanna take a risk. Innovation takes courage and part of that courage is one of my mantras. I say, act bigger than you are. Take on a bigger idea. As a good friend of mine says, and I tweet repeatedly, by the way, I'm at Rosabeth Cantor. Um, I tweet repeatedly, it takes as much time and energy to dream small as it does to dream big. So you may as well dream big. And you may as well present yourself as somebody capable already of taking on that idea. I was impressed about the Lear Center um, when Marty Kaplan told me that um, from the beginning, the Lear Center, which is just a fledgling little thing, right? An academic center said, we're here to illuminate and repair the world. Gee, that's very big. That's a big mission. But if you embrace something big and aspirational, then it's possible also to have people's ideas, minds open up because as long as their small idea is still accepted, that is, you don't have to have repair the world immediately. You can take a few years. Um, but it opens up people's minds. They get inspired. They start thinking about things. You know, one big company made a huge leap in their uh, uh, innovation and motivation of employees all over the world, a global company, when they rewrote their values. This is IBM. I'll be using a number of IBM examples because it is you know, one of the companies that we think of as iconic establishment. Well, it's not really. When Sam Palmazano became CEO in 2002, um, he thought it was time to refresh IBM values because IBM values had been laid down in the old era I was talking about of top-down, of telling people what to do. And he thought, this is the 21st century. Let's do it differently. And so he set in motion in 2003 a values jam, a jam like a jazz jam on the web in which all an immense number of employees, it was about 350,000 at that time, could weigh in on a three-day web chat about what IBM's values should be for the 21st century. So opening up to people's ideas. And it was an interesting phenomena because there were a lot of fears, a lot of concerns about that. There was a board member on his board who said, Sam, you don't want to do that. That's socialism, which, I, which at that time was a really bad word. I understand now that there are people who think it might be a good word in America. And I know that these days everyone wants to be Swedish. So. Um, <laughs> I say that only partly as a joke. In fact, the Nordic model has been very successful. Of, of, um, but anyway, so there was a lot of concern. And they said, what are you going to hear? And how do you open it up? And what do you do if it's only criticism? And he said, well, this is the 21st century. He said, in this century, our employees are educated. They're cynical. They're not going to believe anything we do from the center. They're only going to believe it if they're part of it, and we should hear what they have to say. So they did it. They did it, and they got back something like 140,000 people participated. They discovered what we're partly discovering on the web. For all the ugliness that gets spread, there, I mean, on comments and social media, for all the ugliness that gets spread, there are also people that police the negative because they want the positive. And so in the first day when some people were negative, people said, get over it, what's your solution? And by the end of this time, they had 
a huge amount of input and there was a committee, there had to be some people who boiled it down and they boiled it down to three core values. The centerpiece, the second core value was innovation that matters for our clients and the world. And that phrase, and the world, turned out to make a huge difference in how people felt in other countries about working for this giant and what difference they could make. And I saw this through interviews in 22 countries. That was an immense project. But we heard from people who said that was permission to start thinking about the world outside the company. And when you start thinking about the world outside what's established, you get new ideas because you see problems and you say, hey, I wonder how our technology could solve that problem. And so you get new ideas. So opening up the conversation to many people and seeking their input and their ideas. And by the way, IBM also got out of that development of a technology to run those massive web chats without crashing. And that was a huge benefit. And they did it later to have the entire company vote on innovation priorities. Would you believe that a large company would have people vote on what our priorities should be for the future? But they did it. And um, that, that was courageous. It didn't solve all the problems of bureaucracy. It didn't solve all the financial problems, although they want to do it now. But that's the first thing. Where are you going to find the ideas? And the answer is that you ask people and you let them get involved. That was subversive, by the way, when I said those things in 1983. Totally subversive that you ask people and let them get involved. Today, especially among the new generations, they won't have it any other way. I mean, try to tell them what to do as opposed to asking them politely if they will volunteer to do their job and have an idea about a better way to do it. And that is the way to treat people today. But then the second thing you have to do to have an innovation culture is that you have to be able to develop the ideas into something workable. Because just having an idea, ideas are a dime a dozen, there are so many ideas. There are things we want, things we do. You actually do need solutions. You actually do need actual models and prototypes and something you can show. And there was a time in Silicon Valley when you could get funded from the back of an envelope. You just had a concept like, hey, let's set up a website where we will ship pet food. People love their pets. They have to replenish pet food all the time, pets.com and it got a lot of money. Of course, it didn't figure out how heavy it is to ship dog food. It's still amazing to me that Amazon has a flourishing business shipping you diapers if you have, if you have a young child, but they do, but maybe that's more cost efficient to ship now. But you have to develop the idea into something. And developing the idea, developing the dream also needs a culture, but now it's a culture where people talk to each other, where people collaborate, where people who have a big vision work together to get it because nobody does these things alone. Maybe a thought leader can do things alone. And by the way, Marty, those 24 honorary doctorates, you have to like commencement a lot in order to do that. But I mean, there are some things you can do alone, but otherwise you need a team, you need partners, et cetera. And you need the flexibility to keep changing your mind. So developing ideas requires what I think of as disciplined flexibility. Um, and it requires pulling together all the people who might have something to contribute to the idea. So you crowdsource, you get a lot of ideas, but then you have to crowdsource a team. You have to put together people who will complement each other to build it. Um, so here's another IBM thing. IBM has a breakthrough in, um, it used to be called artificial intelligence. I won't use that word anymore because that's another one that seems kind of ugly to some people, like they're going to replace my mind. My mind is irreplaceable. No, so they call it cognitive computing. That is computers that can process a lot of data and come up with answers that nobody had put in there. And they demonstrated that first 
by picking a big goal that was not a business goal. The head of the unit that developed the technology called Watson, clever name, um, because that was the founder, called Watson. He said, we need a goal to unite the team between, behind something sexy and exciting. And so he said, hey, why don't we try to beat human players at Jeopardy? So I don't know how many of you watched the episode of Jeopardy in which this cuddly little computer, they made it look like R2-D2 or something with flashing lights. It was actually something like 18 servers, and a, but one Jeopardy. And it was because this team had a goal, had a collective sense of what they might achieve that would be fun. I mean, you don't develop ideas as a chore because we'd rather put our brains, you know, leave our brains at home and just bring our bodies to work. Otherwise, if it's a chore, they made it fun. They created a team. And the way the team did it, actually, they started discovering that even a small development team could operate in silos. And so one person would come and say, um, well, I'm a little stuck on this because the person over there hasn't yet given me what they're going to do. And then someone else would say the same thing. And the, the head of the team was calling up people, saying, why don't you talk to each other? Then he had a brainstorm. He said, put everybody in one room. Now, that seems pretty simple, right? And yet we don't often do it have a collective goal, a collective definition of success, something that we all care about, and we're all together communicating about it. That's incredibly important to a culture of innovation. Um, and when you do that, you often have unexpected developments, unexpected events. And if you're all together, you can work on it together. Because a lot of strategy, especially for innovation, is improvisational theater. It's not like traditional theater. So I'm using lots of communications metaphors and ideas here because I'm at the Annenberg School and the Norman Lear Center. I, but this is a classic distinction I've made between strategy as traditional theater, which means you write a plan, you write a script, you work on perfecting the script, then you tell everybody their parts, and they can't really deviate from those parts, or they'll ruin the whole idea. That's traditional. That's the way we often do routine things. But if you want innovation, you need it to be much more like improv, where you have a theme, you have this audacious goal, like we're going to beat a, the human experts on Jeopardy. You have a goal, and you, you start trying things. And if it fails, you, you test it in front of audiences. In the tech world, they call it rapid prototyping. You create a prototype, you test it, you get audience feedback, the audience talks to you, and eventually you refine it enough with users in mind that you make a big difference. And so improvisational theater matters. There's a company now in Silicon Valley that is one of the, the unicorns, the companies who reach a billion dollars in va valuation, and it's done it early. It's called Slack. Any of you Slack users? Aha, see a lot of you. This is very California. But Slack has done incredibly well. Do those of you who are users know how Slack started and what its first product was? It had a different name then, too. Slack started with they were going to be um, a massive multiplayer game on the web. That was it. They were just for fun and games. That was its business. And it didn't work. But they had a lot of investors with sunk costs. And they had a lot of people that loved the idea of what they were doing. And their, their models, their prototypes hadn't worked. So they went on to figure out another one, very improvisational. And the next one was, if you have a multiplayer game, why not a multiplayer, multi-colleague communication system that helps everybody find out quickly not just how to communicate, but also all the threads and discussions and who's doing what? And that's what Slack has done. In some ways, that was pure improvisational theater. 
And if you're not open to continuing, when your prototype doesn't work, you've got users, you've got an audience, they'll tell you, and you move on with what the development is. And we often develop things very serendipitously in the innovation world. In fact, there was a dramatic improvement in screening women for breast cancer because of the Hubble telescope, the, um, which was scanning space. And because the initial telescope created very fuzzy images, the scientists had to figure out how to take very fuzzy images and refine them. And then somebody realized, not only did they get better images of outer space, but you could use that for better images of the body and use it diagnostically. So strategy is improvisational theater. You need disciplined flexibility. That is, the team has to be solidly together and yet be willing to be flexible in a culture of innovation, to develop innovation. Um, and you need to be attentive to all of your users, all of your stakeholders. So my quick example of that is the strange case of Uber. Uber, I'm fascinated by Uber. Uber has huge consumer demand. People love Uber. But Uber is banned in many countries, some cities, and has managed to reach a market valuation of $62.5 billion while pissing off, excuse the language, practically all of its stakeholders. There are reasons for nearly everybody to be angry at Uber. Now, clearly, big consumer demand has helped them. But because they have not worked on those relationships with stakeholders, Lyft is coming along fast. And there are many people, especially after there, uh, an Uber driver shot a lot of people in, Mix in Michigan, a lot of people said, I think I'll call a Lyft. Not because Uber could have screened them out, but because Uber could have responded more responsibly to its stakeholders. Uber knew early in the day that there was erratic behavior on the part of the driver, and it could have cut off that driver immediately while they investigated. Instead of saying, not our fault, we're just a software platform. So you don't move innovation forward. You know, you can get it off the ground, but you don't really move it forward unless you know how to work with all the stakeholders. And so I talk about that as a particular principle. I say that. Um, you know, there's a familiar saying from the old African proverb, it takes a village. I say it doesn't take just a village. Village is too small. It takes a cross-sector, multi-stakeholder coalition. <laughs> and as we all say, that doesn't trip off the tongue, but it has been engraved on various bowls and other things by people who have been exposed to this idea. Because to do anything significant, so you can have the ideas, find the ideas, you can get teams behind the ideas, you can even improvise your way to a reasonable product, but then in order to make it bigger, in order to have it reach its potential, particularly if it's an idea you think really will illuminate and repair the world, then you need all those stakeholders on your side not against you. And so a culture of innovation is also a culture where you don't turn your back on, say, public officials because, oh, they're so establishment. And they just want to hang on to the rules for the benefit of incumbents, which is a sort of an Uberish thing to say. They, that's not the case. In fact, there are innovators among the public sector. In fact, the city of Boston has what's called the Urban Mechanics Lab. It's their version of the drugstore or of an innovation lab. And the city of Boston has developed apps, including one that turns your car into a giant sensor to sense potholes. So they can send out crews immediately. You don't even have to call it in. They have are very technology friendly. And so befriending those who are in a position to help the idea move to a bigger scale is really smart strategy. And that's part of a culture of innovation, too. And then, and then finally, you definitely need to be prepared for opposition. Because for every innovation, 
as I said, change is a threat when done to me versus done by me. For every in innovation done by me or by us, somebody else feels it's inflicted on them and they're going to resist. And when are they going to resist? Not at the beginning, because who cares? You're too small. It may never happen. You can do it stealth. You're peripheral. It's when it looks like it's successful and going to succeed. So just when you think your innovation will really surface and your team's or your company's model will take hold, that's when you get the lawsuits. That's when you get the critics. That's when you get the attention that can be negative attention as well as positive attention. Now, it is suspected that Uber kind of liked the negative attention because they got a lot of free media or earned media, and I guess that may be true of a presidential candidate too. But after a while, it does come back to bite people that it's been so negative. And so the middles are very difficult. Um, that's when critics surface. And so I um, identified what I call Cantor's Law. Cantor's Law is that everything can look like a failure in the middle. And you have to be prepared for that. You need the flexibility to regroup. But if you've done it right, if you have a base of support because a lot of people have had a chance to contribute to whatever you're doing, if you have a team that really believes in it and feels united behind one goal, and if you have befriended the stakeholders early, not waiting until they're ready to drive you out of town, then you can master these middles. And there are inevitable bumps in the road in every attempt to innovate, every attempt to innovate. And so persistence and flexibility are really important in innovation. Um, you know, Newton's third law of thermodynamics for every, for every, no, not thermodynamics, just Newton's third law, for every action, there will be an equal and opposite reaction. Well, one has to be prepared for that. And therefore, this is where it goes from a thousand flowers blooming to the hundred or ten ideas that truly have built commitment of the people along the way. Those are going to flourish. So now in 2016, one of my preoccupations besides helping more organizations transition to the digital age, understand the realities of innovation and change, harness the forces of technology to be good for the country, to create jobs, rather than to be a source of fear and trembling. In addition to that, I'm preoccupied with the same thing the Lear Center is, of repairing and illuminating the problems of the world. And that's a big mission, and that's one that I want more innovators to do. And increasing, uh, increasingly, entrepreneurs are not just building companies. They're building social enterprises. They're building ventures with a social mission, even though they're also going to make money. And I think that is where we need to go in the world, not just as an abstract exercise, as let's understand innovation, but as an imperative for keeping America on the positive path we've been on because we have encouraged innovation and entrepreneurship. And so we need innovation entrepreneurs. We need the thousand flowers. Let silly ideas surface too. Let's just have more ideas around us all the time. And in Los Angeles, they don't have to plunge in icy water at midnight. We need disciplined flexibility, receptive users, who work with us in an improv way as audience and as participants. We need those connectors between sectors and stakeholders. I think entrepreneurs should be at the table with government policy people, with big business, small business. It shouldn't be a divide. In fact, millennials, I know my publicist example, publicist convened its top executives and deliberately dipped into the organization to include also millennials and their voices. And I think that's incredibly and increasingly important. So we need everybody at the table. We need a culture 
that produces receptivity to new ideas. So I'm going to end with a couple of my mantras, some of which I've already said. One is, if you want a lot of creativity, you do have to go widely beyond establishments. And that doesn't mean establishments are bad, but it means you have to go beyond them. So one of my mant favorite mantras is that we say for creativity that you've got to think outside the box. I say a box isn't big enough. You have to think outside the building. Because health isn't hospitals, education isn't just schools, the city isn't city hall. It's all the things that surround it. And it can be ideas from anybody anywhere outside the building. We can bring them inside the building or we can develop them on their own, but that's how you get change. This, the second is, you know, it's as much time and energy to dream small as dream big, so you may as well dream big. And that will motivate people behind something that's inspiring. And then remember, of course, that it doesn't just take a village. It takes a cross-sector, multi-stakeholder coalition. So you got to look at all those that might want to support or whose support you might need for the idea and who might have something to contribute. And finally, everything can look like a failure in the middle. So don't give up. If you give up in the middle, by definition, it's a failure. If you keep going with persistence, and flexibility, you can make it a success. And that's how we build a culture of innovation. Thank you.